we had a vow of silence here. Things will be a lot quieter in the monastery. And some of the issues that come up between us or among us just wouldn't happen. But we wouldn't get training in right speech. Which is an extremely important, important part of the training. Because of all the, the precepts that get broken, it's the ones around speech are the ones that are most easily broken. Talk is cheap. It takes just a little bit of energy to open your mouth and say something. And for a lot of us, the problem is that it also takes very little thought. It simply comes into the mind, it seems to pop out the mouth right away, with no filter in between. And this is what we've got to work on, because the filter of our speech is also going to be a very useful filter in the meditation. And if you don't develop it with your speech, it's a lot harder to do it with your meditation. There's that passage where Chan Numpudun talks about monks who've taken a vow of silence. He said, but you weren't silent at all. You're talking full speed in your minds. And so in order to quiet down your internal speech, you have to take a good hard look at your own external speech. To what extent is it really skillful? To what extent are you just speaking through your feelings, through your in intuitions, through your reactions to other people? This is what the Buddhist teachings are going to call the four wrong courses are really helpful. In other words, we go off course either through our desires and likes. We say things to people because we like them or we want something out of them. Or our aversion, you don't like this person and you just want to say something based on your aversion. Delusion, we don't really understand the situation, or fear, there's things we are afraid of and so we speak out of fear. And we end up causing a lot of trouble. So you have to be very careful and look at the way you speak to other people and what's coming out, where is it coming from? There's an old Peanuts cartoon where Lucy complains. She says, if you have to watch, go around watching everything you say, you're never, never going to get much said. And you might reflect on the idea that having less said might be better off, both for you and for the people around you. those words that we filter out. It's a really good thing that we have that filter, because once they're out, you can't take them back. It's a long, hard process to affect a reconciliation when you've said something really sharp and hurting, hurtful, based on your reaction, your knee-jerk reaction right then and there. And so one good rule of thumb is that if you find anger coming up, just don't say anything until you're really clear about the effect of what you're going to say. And if you find the anger coming up, you ask, well, what has been building up here? Why is there this felt need to break forth with something really hurtful? And this way, by looking after your speech, you learn a lot of important things about your mind. Because after all, it's the directed thought and evaluation. They give rise to speech within the mind to begin with, and then get carried out into our external speech. 
and if we don't really evaluate much what we're about to say. When you sit down to meditate, you're not going to have very good powers of evaluation to work with the breath, or to work with whatever your meditation object is. So this is why training the mind is so intimately connected to training the mouth. And again, when you find anger building up or irritation or frustration building up with other people, you've got to stop and ask yourself, okay, why am I feeding on these thoughts? What sort of narratives have I been building up? Are they really helpful? And as we all know with narratives, it's a very selective process of which events or which words, phrases, actions get strung together into a story. And you may want to do a little selective editing there as well. Think about other events that would scramble up the story, especially if it's a story that's getting you frustrated. In this way, looking after your speech, you start seeing other processes in the mind as well, in addition to the right of thought and evaluation. It's how you go around selecting events to, to focus on which events you're highlighting, which ones you're putting into the background. This is a question of perception, the things that you label as important significant, and other things that are not so important. You might want to question that as well. Because all too often when we're frustrated with somebody else, and there can be a lot of that here in the monastery, after we're running a totally volunteer organization. It's all based on generosity. It's all based on what the Thai is called Nam Jai, which is literally your heart juice or heart water, but it means basically your, the spirit you put into things. And it's going to be a little chaotic. Some people are going to feel inspired to help in one area and not in another one. Even though we feel that this particular area needs a lot of help, well, other people may not feel that way. You can speak in a way that encourages them to see the importance. But that's all you can do. And so when things aren't going well, John Fuang had a phrase. He said, you have your internal what and you have your external what. The word what in Thai has many different meanings. The external what would be the monastery. There's another word, wat, which comes from the Pali vata, which means protocol or practice. And you want to make sure that your external wat is always maintained. The things in the external one, keep your internal wat as the one that's maintained. The external wat that may go and have, be in good shape or may not necessarily be in such good shape. But you can't force other people to have your vision of the external one. We can ask other people to, as a John Lee used to say, have eyes that are as big as the monastery. See what needs to be done if you feel moved to do it. We appreciate your goodness. But everybody's going to have their blind spots. And the problem with blind spots is that it's easy to see other people's blind spots, but you can't see your own. But it's your own blind spots. Those are the ones that are the real troublemakers. That's the ignorance that we're trying to see through. And if you find that you're suffering from other people's ignorance, well, you've got to turn around and look at your own ignorance. Because that's where the real suffering is coming from. So if you're focused there, 
It's very unlikely that your word's going to be harmful. That's what he used to say, no matter how good or bad other people are. It doesn't take you to heaven, it doesn't take you down to hell. It's your own thoughts, words, and deeds that can take you to heaven or to hell. And whether you think of it as hell in this lifetime or hell in the next one, it's not a good place to be. So it's up to what you're doing, what you're saying, what you're thinking. That's what's important. You always keep that in mind. You want to maintain the quality of those three areas where you really are responsible. So always keep the focus inside. Remember, you can't be responsible for what other people do. There's that old case where if you find somebody has a weapon, they're you're afraid they're going to use it against you, you've got to kill them first. Well, that's what you've done. You've just killed them. Now the karma is yours. You never, they never had the chance to do any bad karma. But now you've taken the bad karma. It's not an act of compassion. Now that you have to really look at what you're doing all the time. rather than focusing on what other people are doing or not doing. Because that's what you're doing or leaving undone. That's the real issue in your life. Your speech is wise and compassionate, well considered, and it creates a good environment for the practice, both for you and for the people around you. So when you break silence, make sure you do it wisely.